Hi, my name is Shelly. I am a grateful follower of Jesus Christ, and I am saved by grace. I find it so important to say that because only by God's grace can I be here today sharing my story with you. I was a methamphetamine user for 28 years. I was in and out of jail. I was um, a absent parent, and um, all of this was a result of emotional and sexual abuse from my childhood. When I was 10 years old, we, um, we got involved in a religious cult, and I was removed from the home, um, taken from my parents' home, and put with a family and where I was constantly abused sexually, and um, that caused me to be very confused, very anxious, and I felt um, rejected by my parents, so I couldn't, I, didn't feel that I could share with them what was going on. Um, uh, this progressed for about three, three and a half years, and then um, we left. We left that uh, cult, um, but I had been completely uh, separated from anything in the outside world. I had no idea how to acclimate or or fit in. So I turned to drugs and um, started doing drugs when I was 12 years old. And um, this developed into a um, horrific drug addiction all throughout my adult life until I was 39 years old. I met someone that, inter that told me about Celebrate Recovery and um, I had no idea what it was, but I was a little bit curious. I had never been able to get clean for myself, for my kids, for my parents, for anyone and um, I attended a Celebrate Recovery meeting and God met me there in that room. He, he planned it. I was part of his plan that I be there and I saw people that were just like me but they had years clean and they didn't judge me and they loved me because we were all brothers and sisters in Christ. I've been sober now for almost nine years and um, I have experienced incredible life change. I have gone from being in and out of jail and running the streets literally to um, uh, working in a ministry of Celebrate Recovery and sharing my story and helping others experience life change. For anyone out there that's hearing my story that's feeling broken or worthless or can relate to anything I've said, there is a chance for redemption for everyone. Everyone is loving you. We're all sinners, and we all fall short of the glory of God, but this is where you need to be. And you're always welcome at Celebrate Recovery, Monday nights at 6.30 at the McCulloch campus, and I hope to see you there and come up and give me a hug. You know, I don't ever get tired of the stories of life change. They are dramatic. They are wonderful. Uh, they are uh, just a reminder that no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what's been done to you or what you've done, uh, God can redeem your life and change your life. And by the way, uh, there's a, a table out in the main lobby right out here that is uh, full of material and information about Celebrate Recovery. And uh, Shelly and some of the other Celebrate Recovery leaders are going to be there this weekend. And so if you have questions, if you can relate, uh, then they're there to answer any questions you have, uh, pray with you, help you, encourage you uh, any way they can. Hey, let me uh, encourage you to take your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is our text as we are continuing our Unleashed series. And uh, if you uh, don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,122, 1,122, and you'll find Romans chapter 8. You'll be able to follow along. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. So we're talking about how God can unleash us from those uh, obstacles, those chains, those things that hold us down from being the people of God that he created us to be. Uh, and the battle to be unleashed, to live in freedom, is probably seen most clearly in the battle with addiction. 
And, and today we're talking about addiction and recovery. And recovery just means living in victory over your addiction. And biblically, the Apostle Paul describes the fight within us in Romans, really chapter 7 and 8. So what I want to do is I want to pick up toward the end of Romans chapter 7. It's still on page 1122. Uh, but I want to pick up with Romans 7 verse 21. And, and I want you just to listen, follow along if you will, but listen to the Apostle Paul as he describes this battle inside of us. He says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging a war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So if we want to have victory, if we want to be free, if we want to live unleashed, First thing we need to know is we all are addicted to sin. We all are addicted to sin. Did you, did you catch that as the Apostle Paul was writing? Listen to verses 22 and 23 again in chapter 7. He says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, in my body. We are all addicted to sin. Because the Apostle Paul was probably one of the holiest men who ever lived. I mean, let's just go ahead and, and acknowledge that we're not nearly as good as the Apostle Paul. I mean, God used him to write about half the New Testament. He started churches all over the Roman Empire. He, he was a force for the kingdom of God that we're still talking about 2,000 years later. And he describes an addiction to sin. You can go back and read more of chapter 7 because he describes it even in more detail there. But he says, I don't want it, yet I crave it. He, he says, I desire to do better, but he struggles against his desires. And, and, and really, that's all of us. I mean, that's me. That's you. That's all the people in the world. We are ruined by sin. And sin destroys. Sin is destructive. By the way, that's exactly why God sent Jesus into this world to redeem us from our sin. You did catch that, right? In verse 3 of chapter 8, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. Jesus' death on the cross was the payment for our sin. It was to redeem us from our sin. And now, and this might be the best verse in the whole of Scripture that you might want to mark it, circle it, whatever. In verse 1 of chapter 8, there is therefore now, what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus is the answer to and the escape from sin. He is the one who provides forgiveness. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why do we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ, there's condemnation. That's not a good thing. You do not want what you deserve. Well, I don't know about you. I don't want what I deserve. Because what I deserve is death and hell. I like the whole thing about grace a whole lot better. That's why if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want you to take that step of committing your life to following Jesus with your life, 
to acknowledge that he's the son of God and savior of the world, that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and for you to make that commitment to follow Jesus with your life. That's how you can live in that place where there's no condemnation, there's forgiveness of sins. And, and then Jesus provides victory. He said the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. And Jesus is the only one who can set us free. In verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That, that's what Jesus has done. Forgiveness, victory, freedom. By the way, one of our essential beliefs here at Calvary, we only have five. You can check them out on our website. But the only, there's five. One of them is all people are sinners and need the grace of God. All of us. All of us. So today, we know you're a sinner. Now, I hope that doesn't offend you because I know I'm a sinner. I'm up here telling you that I'm a sinner. Here's what we don't know. We don't know if you've received the grace of God. We don't know if you're living in that place of knowing that there's no condemnation for you because of your relationship with Jesus. And we want you to know that. And, and realize you don't have to have it all together to come to Jesus. You just come to Jesus, broken, a mess, and Jesus will heal you. Um, here, here's how Scripture puts it. The Apostle John, in, in the first chapter of his first letter, uh, says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Romans chapter 10, uh, the Apostle Paul says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We want you to know today that there is no condemnation for you if you'll embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Jesus will change your life because we are all addicted to sin and, if we're honest, some are held captive by an addiction today. Some who are sitting here right now are held captive by an addiction. Now, we could play the church game and go, what, here in church? Never. Um, yeah, here in church, in this place. Uh, you see, that's what church is supposed to be, a place for those who are struggling to come. Because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came to heal the sick, yeah. He said it's not the people who are well that need a physician, it's people who are sick. Jesus came to free the captives. You see, church is a hospital for the sick. It is not a resort for the righteous. Okay? It, the church is supposed to be a hospital for people who are broken and sick and hurting. It is not a resort for righteous people to hang out at and go, are you doing great? I'm doing great too. Thumbs up. Well, it's all going to be good. No, it, it, this, this is a place for people who are hurting and broken and, and shattered by life to come. And yes, their lives are a mess. Your lives might be a mess. We're not afraid of that. We understand that. That's who Jesus came into the world to rescue, to save, to set free. And that's what the church is supposed to be. So what are you struggling with? We're not going to ask you to stand up and confess it right now. That's what Monday nights at Celebrate Recovery are for. Okay? Okay, I just got to tell you this. When we started Celebrate Recovery, they kept saying anonymity is really important. Anonymity is really important. Every time I mention Celebrate Recovery, people are standing up and shouting and woohooing and all this kind of stuff. I don't know who came up with that whole anonymity thing, but anyway. <laughs> they're the worst people at anonymity that I know. <laughs> so what are you struggling with? Uh, is it a food addiction? Is it... Alcohol, you're drinking too much, and you know it's out of control. Is it a sex addiction? Is it illegal drugs? Is it prescription drugs? Are you addicted to pornography? Hey, are you struggling with an addiction to video games? Addiction is addiction. And here's the reality. Either we are addicts, we were addicts, or we know somebody that's close to us who is an addict. Because this world is filled with addiction. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus wants to set your family free. Jesus wants to set your friends free. 
So do you want freedom? So do you want freedom? Yes. Okay, well, just checking. If you don't, then I, I might as well stop preaching now. There's nothing else to say. So if you want freedom, uh, let's talk about the recovery process. The recovery process. How do we get to freedom? Um, now, some people that I've talked to, some have stories where they are miraculously set free instantaneously. Uh, it's just a miraculous deliverance. One moment they're in the throes of addiction, whatever that addiction is, and the next moment that God answers a prayer, God works miracles, and they are set free from that. And, and I celebrate that. We celebrate that. We celebrate the miraculous deliverance of people. And we understand and acknowledge that that is the exception. That's the exception. You might go, well, doesn't God have the power to do that? Yes, God has the power to do that. And sometimes he does that. That is just not what is normative in our lives. Most people need a process. You know what? Hey, you know what a process is called biblically? Discipleship. That, that's what it's called. And the fancy word for it is sanctification. If you want to just like go, uh, you know, big word on your friends. It, it means growing up in Jesus. It means learning how to live free learning how to follow him better. Uh, most of us need a process, and most addicts find freedom step by step. doesn't matter what you're addicted to. You, you need that process. You need that step by step. Uh, so we have a recovery ministry that presents a step-by-step -step path to freedom. It's called Celebrate Recovery. You've already heard about it in the video. You've already heard a bunch of people shouting and hollering. Uh, we mentioned the table out there. It meets Mondays at 6.30 at the McCulloch campus. You'll probably hear that again tonight, too. And a lot of people find freedom through that same step process commonly called the 12 steps. It applies not only to celebrate recovery, it applies to Alcoholics Anonymous, it applies to Narcotics Anonymous, it applies to a lot of different groups that, uh, you know, are, are teaching these 12 steps. So tonight I want you to see and hear the 12 step process process, uh, and along with the biblical principles of Celebrate Recovery. And I've invited some of our Celebrate Recovery leaders uh, out here to share this 12-step process with you. They share it every Monday night. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, Shannon and Shelley, and they're going to share with you the, the 12 steps and the biblical principles. Hi, everybody. I'm Shannon. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ in my recovery for drug and alcohol addiction. Hi, Shannon. Hi, everybody. Hi, Shannon. Hey guys, I'm Shelly. I am a grateful follower of Jesus Christ. I'm saved by grace. I struggle with control issues, self-image, and fear of failure, but I praise God because my identity is in Christ and not my struggles. Amen. Amen. Hey Shelly. So we are reading the 12 steps in their biblical comparisons. Number one is, we admitted that we are powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives have become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, Romans 7:18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose, Philippians 2:13. And three, we made, direct, uh, we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Romans 12.1. 4. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3.40. 5. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5.16 6. We were entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4.10 7. We humbly ask him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 8. We made a list of all persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 
do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 631. Nine, we made a direct amends to people whenever possible, except what to do that so would harm injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. 10. We continue to take personal inventory, and when we are wrong, promptly admitted it. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the, for us and the power to carry that out. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. And 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Galatians 6.1. Amen. You see, we're all addicted to sin, and we all need a Savior, and we all need help learning to live free. Uh, that's a reality. Celebrate Recovery is a tangible, practical help for those with addictions and other destructive habits. By the way, only about 40% of the people in Celebrate Recovery are there for chemical addictions. 60% are there for other life issues. Uh, so if you're thinking, hey, I, I could use that, but I don't really, I'm not a, an addict to drugs or alcohol, uh, show up anyway. Now, since we all struggle with sin addiction, let's get real practical, okay? I want to make this really practical because I think the Bible leads us to life, leads us to freedom. It gets real practical. Uh, if we want to live an unleashed life, we need to take some steps, okay? So I'm going to share with you three steps we all need to take. First one is we all need to confess, okay? Confess. This is confronting pride, confronting our pride. Now, I, I love the introductions in the 12 steps. You just heard Shelly and Shannon share theirs. It goes like this. Hi, I'm Chad, and I'm a grateful follower of Jesus who struggles with pride and laziness and lust and gluttony. Okay? I was waiting for someone to say hi, Chad, and they didn't do it. So, uh, <laughs> guys, let me down. I was counting on it. I, I knew it was going to come, and it didn't happen. So, but Because it, it, it's just honest. It's just saying, here's who we are. We, we gain strength. If we want to gain strength, we have to admit our weaknesses. And to find freedom, we need to admit that we're captives. And we don't want to do this because we're proud. Look, a lot of you are like, I don't want to stand up in front of people and tell them what I struggle with. And, and that urge to not do that is pride. Can, can we just acknowledge that pride gets in the way? We're worried about what other people think. We're worried about our reputation. We're worried about our image. I mean, half the world right now is wrapped up in social media and, and trying to pose the best and pretend like they had the best vacation in the history of the world. And, uh, and we all know it's a lie. Okay, it, it just, it, we're, but that's pride. And pride holds us prisoner in our sin addiction. I, I hope you see that. Confession is God's prescription for freedom. First, you've got to confess to God. You've already heard this twice. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Don't be afraid about what God thinks. God is waiting to forgive you right now. So confess to God. That's personal. That's you and God. That's having prayer. That's conversation with him. Saying, God, I know I've blundered. I know I've messed up. I know my sin. Here it is. He's going to forgive you. It doesn't stop there, though. The second is you've got to confess to others. That's the hard part. See, a lot of you are like, I can confess to God, all right. I don't want anyone else to know. James 5.16, you heard it shared just a moment ago. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So that you can be healed. See, pride, you can live in pride and you can be forgiven by God, but you're going to live in addiction. You're going to still be trapped in that sin. See, God forgives and then he gives us our fellow Christians, the body of Christ, so that we can find freedom. And I know this is hard. Might be the hardest part. Because I grew up in churches where there was so much pride, people only confessed to God. 
They completely ignored James chapter 5. It's like it wasn't in the Bible. And you know what the result was? There was no freedom and there was no power. There was lots of posturing and pretending and hypocrisy. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he can exalt you. That he can exalt you. So the first step to freedom is confession. And for some of you, that first step is showing up Monday night at Celebrate Recovery. Saying, hey, I need this. Uh, so the first step to freedom is confession. Then you've got to surrender. Surrender. And that's where we confront self-reliance. We're confronting self-reliance. If you want freedom, you need help. Okay, now it was really cute when my oldest daughter was about one and a half, two, and she was trying to put on her shoes or she was trying to put on her jacket or she was trying to do something and we would go to help and she would get all frustrated and push us away and say, my do it, my do it. And, you know, as parents, you're like, oh, that's so cute. But if we grow up and become an adult that refuses help from people who love them and want to encourage them and want to see them set free, and they refuse that help, you know what that is? That's not cute. That's tragic. See, on some hands, we applaud uh, that, that self-reliance. We want you to be responsible for your life. We want you to be responsible for your choices. But we were created to be dependent. I know that's uncomfortable for some of you. First of all, we we're created to be dependent on the Holy Spirit of God. We must surrender to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We have to acknowledge that God's way is better than our way. We need to surrender to the wisdom of Scripture. The Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe in and how to live. And we need to say, you know what, God, the way that you think is, is better than the way that I think. We need to embrace the counsel of those who are wiser than us. We need to learn to ask questions and listen and receive rebuke. By the way, the book of Proverbs is really clear. If you can receive a rebuke, you're wise. If you don't receive a rebuke, you know what you are? Oh, never mind, you can read it and figure it out. Uh, it's the opposite of wise, though. You see, we need to yield to the accountability and encouragement that others provide us. We all need accountability. We all need encouragement. Can I just be honest? I love living in Lake Havasu. And one of the best things about living in Lake Havasu is that everywhere you go, you see people that you know. Right? You know what that means? That means that there is 360 degree accountability in Lake Havasu City. You are not going to get away with anything. And you know what I love about that is you can't be fake and thrive in this town. And I know that, so I can't have any off days. I can't decide I'm going to be one way at church and be a different way at the grocery store. It's not going to work. That's accountability, and it's a beautiful thing, and we all need that accountability if we're going to just thrive and live free. So we've got to conf you know, confront our pride by confessing, and then we've got to surrender, uh, which means that we're going to stop relying on ourselves, and then we've got to repent got to repent. All of us need to repent, which means we confront our destructive habits. By the way, repentance just means change. If you don't like that word because of the way you grew up and people yelling at you, uh, just understand yelling isn't what God had in mind. Change is what God has in mind through repentance. Changing the direction of your life. Changing your mindset. Listen to the Apostle Paul again. These are, you just might as well just go ahead and circle all of Romans 8 and just, you know, read it. He says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Repentance is changing your mind. It's changing how you think so that you're, you're not caught up in the things of death. Now you're caught up in the things of life and peace because your destructive habits lead to a mindset of death. Repentance means that you're going to embrace that mindset of life and peace. And here's the thing. Your habits are not going to change unless you confront them. Your habits are not going to suddenly, miraculously just disappear without you directly confronting them. 
which means inviting God into the equation, inviting some others into the equation, and changing your habits. And drastic changes are needed. We're not talking about tweaks. We're talking about dynamite here. Okay, th th that's what it takes. Because some of you have been battling these destructive habits for decades. And you just decided, hey, you know what? It's always going to be there. And God's saying tonight to you, I can set you free. I can set you free. If you'll go ahead and take this first step, I can set you free. Let's start on this, on this path. That might mean rehab. Some of you are like, I'm not going to rehab. That's your problem. You're not going to rehab. Your friends want you to go to rehab. Your family wants you to go to rehab. You need to decide to go. Oh, I can't afford it. You don't understand. Uh, really. So you can, it's better to go ahead and destroy your family and your life than to go to rehab? For some of you, it means going to, you know, a 12-step group and celebrate recovery. Mondays at 6.30 is one of those. But I got great friends that go, you know, go and lead AA groups and NA groups and, and all kinds of other help groups. Look, it, it isn't just one. We got two celebrate recoveries in town, by the way, not just one. Thursday nights at Hilltop is, is another great one. Look, it doesn't matter to me where you go. Just do something. If that's what you need to do, then take that step. Show up. Some of you might need to change your friend group because you're surrounded by people who are going, uh, well, they're going to hell in a handbasket and you're going with them. And you just need to change your friend group because whatever direction your friend group is traveling, that's where you're going. Scripture tells us that in two ways. First Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Proverbs puts it another way. Solomon says, the one who walks with the wise becomes wise. Who are you hanging around? What direction are they going? By the way, this is why we really, really, really want everyone to be in a life group. You guys think we push life groups for some other reason? No, it's because you need people in your life who love Jesus and who care about you and are sharing life with you because they will encourage you in life. They will help you to walk with Jesus better because you're all moving in that same direction of following Jesus. And when somebody starts getting out of line, your friends will yank you back. And, and you go, well, it's, it's middle of the season. I can't join a life group right now. Go to Celebrate Recovery. They are a great support group because they, they will speak the truth into your life. And I love that. You know, you might have to change your friend group. You definitely have to change your routine. It, you know, you got to make time for God. If you're going to have that new mindset, then you've got to spend time with God in prayer. You've got to spend time with God in Scripture. We give away Bibles because we want you to read them, because we want you to encounter God. That's changing your routine. A chapter a day will change your routine. It's in your life notes. You can take it home and follow along with the rest of the church. Look, we want God to change your life. Jesus came to set you free. He did his part. Are you going to do your part and take a step toward Freedom, right after the service, members of our prayer team are going to be here at the front. They would love to pray with you, talk with you, encourage you. We have a table set up in the main lobby with people from Celebrate Recovery, leaders, who would be glad to talk with you, pray with you, encourage you. Why? Because Jesus came to set us free from everything that destroys us, including addiction. Let's pray. Father, you give us freedom, and we trade it for trinkets and baubles and experiences and things that aren't important, and yet we give ourselves over to captivity, over to slavery, and you want us to be free. So God, meet us here. Speak into lives of, of those who've been hiding their addiction, hiding their habits for years, for decades, and, and tonight, let it be a time of freedom. Let your spirit move in this place. Let us listen. Let us yield. Let us surrender. And let our chains be broken so that we can walk in freedom, walk with Jesus, surrounded by people who love us and care for us and cheer for us. So God, whatever step we need to take, give us the courage, make us brave so we can take that step tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.